It's time for more exciting adventures with op-amps. In this video, we're going to look at the parallel-parallel negative feedback configuration. This is a current sensing voltage output configuration, but we're also going to modify it. And this is the basic run-up of the circuit. Op-amp, input goes into the minus input, the plus input goes to ground. Here's our output, so you know, maybe a load resistor out here. And then we have one feedback RF resistor sitting out there. That's it. This is parallel, parallel. And you're saying, wait a minute, how can this be parallel? How is this parallel? All right, here's your input current. Well, think about it this way. The input current has to split at the input. It either goes in or it goes through the RF. Split means there's a parallel connection. Right? versus a series connection where it's got to go through everything. Output, same deal. Right? Output current, RF or RL. Another way of looking at this is through Miller's theorem. All right, so Miller's theorem basically says you can take an impedance that bridges an inverting amplifier, something like this, some Z, and you can transform it into a Z in Miller and a Z out Miller. And those clearly are parallel connections. Just a mathematical transform. Um, this is essentially what we use on that little capacitor that's um, usually in the driver stage. If you go back and either look in the book or one of the earlier videos, you'll notice there's a little capacitor, maybe like uh, 30 picofarads or something like that. Um, like in a 741, um, that sets the frequency response of the amplifier, the open loop frequency response. And uh, it's basically a Miller capacitor because what ends up happening is the capacitance is multiplied by the gain of the amplifier. It's actually A plus one, but we have a larger effective capacitance and uh, therefore we don't have to have physically as large a value to get the same sort of critical frequency that we want. But anyway, I don't want to divert too much. How do we analyze this? So this has an input current and an output voltage. I want to come up with a, an equation for V out. All right. Let's remember those two rules that we came up with last time. Number one, V error, which is the difference between the plus and minus inputs, is approximately zero. Number two, input current into the op amp, not the input current of the circuit, but the input currents into the op amp, so I'll make a little note here. Also zero. All right, so what ends up happening? Well, when you look at this circuit, if the differential input voltage is ideally zero, then this point right here is virtually ground. And we, in fact, call that a virtual ground. It's not really ground, right? I mean, you wouldn't want to clip the black lead of an oscilloscope probe to that point. It's not a true ground, but it's virtually ground in that the voltage there is really, really tiny. It's nearly zero. That makes it an ideal current summing node. So that's something we can use for uh, a summing amplifier that has multiple inputs and one common output. Think in terms of, you know, several microphones going into a single signal, like, uh, you know, a, a TV or radio broadcast, you got five people talk and they all have their own microphones. You don't want to have to have five loudspeakers in your TV, right? Just one signal. So we need a way of doing that. So that's an ideal current summing node. Now, if the input current in the op amp is zero, then all of this I in has to go this way. It has to go through RF. And that means that the voltage across RF is going to equal that input current times RF. It's just Ohm's law. So a positive input coming current like this, we get a polarity like this at the output, or excuse me, across the RF. Now, notice this end of RF is at the output node, right? Here's RL. It turns out that V load or V out is equal to the negative of VRF. Look at the polarities over here, right? This is minus, that's plus. 
That's a virtual ground. This is a real ground. It's not immediately apparent, but through Miller's theorem, we can see that RF effectively is in parallel with RL. However, the polarity is flipped upside down. It's minus the plus this way. In other words, minus the plus this way. So V out is inverted. And if you just combine these two things, we say that V out would have to equal a negative of INRF. So if we look at it as an, um, an output-input ratio, in other words, V out over V in, excuse me, I in, that just equals negative RF. So RF is referred to as the trans resistance of the amplifier. Properly, it is a transducer. It's a current to voltage transducer. Common use for this is on the output of uh, digital to analog converters. Those things are modeled as current sources, but we want a constant voltage output. So we run that current into a circuit like this and we establish a nice output voltage that's independent of whatever the load impedance is. Otherwise, um, the load impedance will play a role in, in uh, uh, what the output voltage is, right? Ohm's law. Okay, so this is useful by, by itself. However, it turns out to be doubly handy if we just add an input resistor to it, like so. Now what's going to end up happening is all of our input signal, and we're going to put a voltage out here now, all of that voltage is going to drop across RI, and that's what's going to create I in. And then we're back to this circuit. So basically this resistor just takes the input voltage and turns it into a current. In other words, I in in this circuit has to equal through Ohm's law V in divided by RI. Well, if you plug that into this equation up here, then V out would have to be a negative V in times RF over RI. Or more conveniently for us, V out over V in, in other words, the gain of the amplifier is a negative RF over RI. Another very useful equation. So we often refer to this as the inverting voltage amplifier. And the series parallel we refer to it as a non-inverting voltage amplifier. One of each. Very often we don't want inversions. And most of the time we don't want inversions. So, you know, the series parallel works out really well. One downside on this is the input impedance is controlled by RI. Right? In the series parallel, Zn is just huge at low frequencies. In this circuit, Zn is set by RI. So you can't really get, as practically speaking, as high of an input impedance on this circuit as you can with the series parallel. Right? But that doesn't mean it can't be high enough for whatever your application is. There are some other downsides to this configuration that we will see um, upcoming videos are in the book, but it is certainly a very useful circuit. Sometimes we do need um, an inversion. And like the series parallel, it's not the precise value of the resistor that matters, it's the ratio. Okay, so remember the series parallel was one plus RF over RI. Right, so this is just a negative RF over RI. The difference being, again, Ri plays a role in the input impedance. So as an example, right, do a little design example over here. You have a specification. You need to make an amplifier that inverts. We need an inverting amplifier. And let's say we need gain 
of oh 15 15 inverting right negative 15. we also have a requirement for the input impedance zn has to be at least um 20k all right to avoid excessive loading from you know, whatever's driving this how do i design that circuit well the zn dictates um, what ri has to be because ri is setting z in if i need the z in of at least 20k that forces my hand i have to have an ri of at least 20k and then it's just a matter of figuring out okay what gives me a gain of 15. so 20 times the magnitude of 15 will tell me what rf is Right, so we need a 300k resistor in there. And there's our inverting voltage amplifier. Now, as you'll see in the future, if these resistors get too big, we're going to have other problems with noise and offset and drift and such. So, you know, we might do something a little bit different here. We might, um, we might take the inversion part of the equation and uh, do that separate from the gain part in other words this is obviously a more expensive solution but it depends on what your needs are another way of doing this would be to use a series parallel up front and then use this to get you the inversion. Look at these as two separate things. Oh, I need a gain of 15 and I need a, an input impedance of 20K. Well, getting the Z in of 20K off the series parallel is a piece of cake. That's just, it's gonna be huge. So I could either configure this as a buffer with a gain of um, one, but more typically I would put my gain in here and just to use some round numbers so I don't have to grab a calculator, or you don't either, you know, I could get a gain of 15 with a 1K and a 14K, all right? In our ideal world of non-standard resistors, right? 1K over four, 14K over 1K plus one, boom, gain of 15. So that means back here, I could use more modest values. I don't have to have like a huge number. 300K is a pretty big value. I could get like a 10K and a 10K. And this thing now has a gain of minus one. Right, it's 10K over 10K inverting, so minus one. This gives us the gain of 15. So just like any multi-stage amplifier, you just multiply this one by this one. So the gain of the system is negative one times 15 or negative 15. And I have that part of the spec. And you know the input impedance part of it, gotta be more than 20K, well that's sort of inherent at low frequencies with our uh, series parallel amplifier. Yeah, the obvious thing is it's two amps and, um, uh, you know, a couple extra resistors. So it's twice as many components as, you know, this thing over here, right? You know, if this gives you satisfactory performance, do it. Like, why wouldn't you do it? It's fewer parts, so it's going to be, A, less expensive and more likely more reliable. I mean, the fewer parts you have, generally speaking, the more reliable the thing is. It's more stuff to break right so if this works do it if for some reason it doesn't you know like i said maybe this resistor is too big you get you know bad noise or offset okay we can do something a little bit different there are options there is never just a single design that we point to and say yep that's the solution that's it that's the only one there's lots of ways of solving these things okay so there you go inverting amplifier and the idealized uh, current to voltage transducer, right? So this is the basic parallel parallel, and this is sort of the modified parallel parallel, but inverting voltage amplifier. So kind of the, um, the best friend, let's look at it that way, of the series parallel, the non-inverting voltage amplifier. They're gonna take up like 95% of 
of our exploration down the road. Okay, have a good one.